what an honor it is. Not only this morning to be in God's house, but to be able to feel the Shekinah glory of the one true and living God. We believe this morning that there is nothing that our God cannot do. Amen. There is no mountain that he cannot climb. Amen. There is no valley that he cannot walk through. Amen. You cannot bring a problem to him that trumps him. Amen. He's the Alpha. Yeah. He's the Omega. Oh, yeah. He's the Lily of the Valley. He's the Rose of Sharon. God bless you. You may be seated this morning. A question must be asked. Who is this God? The Jews call Yahweh. And who is this God that the apostolic people often refer to as being the only potentate? If you are here this morning, and you do not know him in the power of the Holy Ghost, please, please let me be the one to introduce him to you. As the songwriter penned it, his name is Jesus. He'll be your friend. He's human as well as divine. I want you to meet him. I want you to greet him. This wonderful friend of mine. Can we put our hands together in praise and adoration unto the Lord. For those of you that may not know us, uh, I studied for the priesthood in the Roman Catholic Church for eight years. I studied with the Brothers of Charity of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. I studied with the Trappist monks northwest of Montreal. I am originally from Canada. And I studied with, uh, it's Latin, it's what they call L'Institut Voluntas Dei Primariam Immaculatam, the will of God by Mary Immaculate. Just before I was to take my perpetual vows, the Lord put my feet on another path, on another road. I repented at an apostolic altar. I was baptized in Jesus' name. God filled me with the Holy Ghost. I spoke in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave me a trance. This month represents my being in the apostolic faith 44 years. And I believe that qualifies me to be able to say it's a good life living for the Lord. One day... Sister Hanscom and I came home and there was a message on our answering machine and it was from an archbishop, a Catholic archbishop in Florida. He was over 17 Catholic churches, a seminary and a monastery. And he said, I have read your book from Rome to Jerusalem, and I would like to chat with you. So I absolutely love my apostolic heritage. I love this message. And so I was prepared to uh, protect it and to stand by it. 
But when I called him, his name is Ron McCarthy, Archbishop Ron McCarthy. When I called him, he was 71 years old. And we got to talking. We had so much in common. While I was at the Trappist Monastery at Oka, northwest of Montreal, he was at the uh, Trappist Monastery, Our Lady of the, uh, I believe it's the Holy Spirit, here in the state of Georgia. And so we got to talking about Vespers and different things, and he said, I want to know more about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he said, you mentioned baptism in Jesus' name. He said, after I read your book, I looked through Scripture, and he said, I couldn't find anywhere where anybody baptized in the titles of uh, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It was always in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and so I told him, I said, Ron, you've got to get your eyes off of the Vatican and get your eyes on that city whose builder and whose maker is God. And I led him to a little apostolic church close to where he lived. And he said, I'm going to go there. This was on a Monday. We're talking about a 71-year-old archbishop. And he went, and the congregation was about 30 in number. He said the preacher preached and gave an altar call. He said, I went up. He said, but I, I went to the pastor, and I said, sir, I want to pray, but I don't feel comfortable with people putting their hands on my body. And the pastor got on the mic and he said, folks, uh, we need to respect this individual. He's here to pray. I'm asking no one put their hands on him. And he told me, he, by that time he was calling me pastor. He said, pastor, he said, I began to pray. And he said, I felt things divine. He said, I felt things I never felt in my 71 years of living in the Catholic Church. And he said, all of a sudden, somebody touched me. And he said, it was with a kind force. And he said, I fell on my back. And he said, they told me that I spoke in other tongues for over 30 minutes. They baptized him in Jesus' name. He has left the Catholic Church and is this morning living for God in the beauty of holiness. Somebody came this morning to praise him. So why don't you just go ahead and do what you came to do to begin with. He recently contacted me and he said, now three Catholic priests that he personally ordained when he was a bishop, now have the Holy Ghost and have been baptized in Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap of praise. The psalmist David said he's worthy. What do you say? The psalmist David said he's worthy. Now what do you say? He's great. And he's greatly to be praised. This morning, if you'll allow me, I would like to take you on a journey. A journey from yearning to the seminary of philosophy, to the seminary of theology, to the Oka Monastery, and ultimately 
to an old-fashioned apostolic altar. In the book of John, it's written, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. At the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, the only thing that's really going to matter is the truth. Just give me the truth. If I am your friend this morning, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to exaggerate before you. I'm going to tell you the truth. And if you will hear the truth, the truth will make you indeed free. My mother, she is now deceased. But she always wanted me to be around the priests and the, and the nuns, the ministry of the church. I took art from the nuns, uh, the Sisters of Charity in the town of Perth, and uh, worked with Father Sam there in Aroostook uh, for a long time, did doing different chores. But, it, but being around them made me want to do something for God. And when I was 15 years old, I entered the seminary. I was still in high school. I'll never forget it. I visited the Voluntas Day uh, Grand Seminary of Theology, and the director, uh, Yvon Carpentier, uh, introduced me to Louis-Marie Perrin. He's a Frenchman from Quebec. Uh, he founded the institution, and I sat before him, and, and uh, he came in, he had his Roman co uh, collar on and his cassock, and, and, and let me say this in passing, I love Roman Catholic people. They are some of the most sincere people on the planet. As a matter of fact, I am appalled at religious propaganda. We don't do that. We don't do that. And, and so uh, he looked down over his glasses. I was sitting there 15 years old. And he said, what do you want? And I said, I want to become a priest. And so he pondered for a while. And, and I had informed him that my mom and dad were farmers. Uh, seven children in the family. We had plenty of food, but there was really no money to support my ministry to the priesthood. And he thought for a while and he said, I invite you to go to Three Rivers or trois de Vier, Quebec and study, uh, finish your high school, study your philosophy, your theology uh, to uh, take uh, your perpetual vows. And I said, sir, you don't understand. Mom and daddy just doesn't have the money. And he said, no. He said, you're the one that doesn't understand. He said, I invite you. The, the Roman Catholic Church will pay for all of your studies right up to the priesthood. So I didn't know what to do but to thank him. And I walked outside the door and I was telling pastor yesterday there, at the end of the hall, the long hall, there was an exit light, and a red exit light, and it was blurry. Tears had welled up in my eyes, and I thought, finally, finally, out of the rough, out from a, an old farm boy, God is going to use me uh, to the furthering of the Mother Church on earth. Uh, and I went straight to the chapel, and I got my rosary, and I began to pray. I kissed the, the feet of the statue of the Virgin Mary and began to pray. And I prayed, God, help me. And, and, I, and I invoked the mother of Jesus that I would be the best priest that I could possibly be in my lifetime. And, and, and let me say this, saints of God, please, never underestimate the sincerity 
of people that do not know him in the power of the Holy Ghost. Um, I was doing all that I knew to do. I went to uh, Three Rivers, Quebec. Um, I graduated from high school when I was 16 years old. And uh, the following year, I started my philosophy uh, in the French language. It was a very trying time. I was away from home for the first time, several hundred miles away, and uh, had not, uh, I was not, I could not speak the French language at that time. But something happened when I was at the seminary of philosophy. Uh, and I believe absolutely and positively in the intercessory prayers of the anointed saints of God. You don't have to be a preacher to touch the throne of God. You don't have to be a Sunday school teacher to feel the anointing of God on your life. But when God filled you with the Holy Ghost, He gave you that anointing. And I was in the chapel. We had a small chapel. I was there by myself. Uh, turned the lights down to take away the tangible. And uh, the candle was lit. Uh, we believed in transubstantiation where the, the uh, bread was changed to the body and the wine to the literal blood of Christ. And it represented there the Eucharist, uh, Christ's presence in that box. Uh, and I was praying and all of a sudden I felt the presence of someone in the chapel. I had no connection with apostolic people. I had no a connection with apostolic people until I walked into an apostolic church. But I believe somebody was praying. Somebody, some mother in Zion had a hold of the horns of the altar. Some father in the faith was standing in the gap. But God did know one thing. He knew that I was hungry and he knew that I wanted to know him and please him and walk with him and be used of him. You see, salvation does not start with God. It does not start with a pastor. It does not start with a Bible study. It doesn't start with an invitation to church. It starts with hunger. God is drawn to hungry hearts and salvation is God's response to a hungry heart. Do you remember when you first knelt in His presence? You not only knelt in His presence, but you knelt with a hungry heart. Can we lift our hands high unto the Lord? Let us give Him the only potentate, the King of kings, praise and adoration. I knew that I was alone. But it felt like someone was standing beside me to the point I could hear them breathing. And I was probably about 18 years old at that time. And it scared me because I knew I was alone. And I got up and I turned the light on. There was no one in the room. I went back to the sacristy where the vestments are kept. There was no one back there. So I simply marked it down as a figment of my imagination and went to my room. We had private rooms, and uh, I flipped off the light, uh, found a comfortable spot in my bed, and from inside my room, as a Roman Catholic, I believe I heard the audible voice of God, and my name was called from inside of that room. Not once, it was called twice. I was a teenager and it scared me to death. I finally got up on my elbow. I could literally hear my heart beating in my throat. It was real, but there was something divine going on in that room. And I got up and I flipped on the light. There was nobody 
in the room. After I finished my philosophy, time went on, years passed, and I was to join the Brothers of Charity of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in Riverside, California. I, I began to pray fervently. Uh, I, wanted, I wanted to know God. My, my thinking was, God, if you made me, you can reveal yourself to me. And one day I was praying my rosary in my room. I was about to take my perpetual vows to the priesthood. Poverty, chastity, and obedience. Uh, poverty meant that I could uh, live in a house, but I could never own one. I could drive in a car, but could never have it in my name. Chastity would mean that I would never marry. And that obedience would mean that I would be obedient to my bishop, the cardinals, and then ultimately to the pope or the pontiff uh, in Rome. And as I was praying uh, in my room, I had my lights down and the candle burning. I, I wanted to black, block out the things that are tangible. And, and, and we apostolic people understand today, it doesn't matter what you are. God's not going to ask you if you drove in a Cadillac or a Volkswagen. God's not going to ask you if you lived in a mansion or you lived in a tar paper shack. Uh, amen. The things here below, and we must not be deceived by the silver, and we must not be deceived by the gold, because there's nothing here below that has any eternal value. Uh, amen. You're going to leave it behind. The glory to God, uh, this morning I got my eyes on that city uh, whose builder and whose maker is God. Can we give the Lord a good hand? Oh, come on, somebody. I wish there was an apostolic in here that would just give the Lord a good hand clap of praise. As I prayed, I prayed to the medieval saints. I prayed to the Virgin Mary. I guess at that time in my life, only about 5% of my prayer of life was directed to God. And, uh, but, but as I was praying, as a Roman Catholic, I believe again, I heard the audible voice of God. I did not know it until after God filled me with the Holy Ghost. But there was an apostolic church in Riverside, California, where I was, that was pleading the blood of Calvary over that city. God has a way of penetrating walls. God has a way of penetrating hearts. And as I prayed and venerated the Virgin Mary, I believe I heard again the audible voice of God. And this time, God said, don't take those vows. My head, I was already on my knees. My head immediately went to the floor. And just in a few moments, there were two puddles of water that formed on the floor before me. My eyes were flooded with tears. I was so hungry to know God. And the next morning I went in, I was talking to Timothy, who was actually the head of the novitiate there. And he said uh, it, with a smile, are you ready to take your vows? And I said, sir, there's not going to be any vows. I said, I'm going to Montreal and I'm going to go to the Trappist Monastery. Uh, and, and, and he said, what's going on? I said, I, I understand your thinking, and I have to admit, I'm confused. But I believe last night, I heard the audible voice of God directed me not to take the vows. I said, I believe there's something else. He said, there is nothing else. I said, but there's something beyond. He said, there's nothing beyond. You're looking for something that does not exist. You're seeking something that never happened and will not happen. And he said, you just need to focus on your praying to the Virgin Mary and everything is going to be all right. And, and he said, besides, you're tired. And I said, 
Maybe I am tired. He said, I want you to go to the retreat house in Banning, California. Uh, he said, there's a swimming pool, palm trees. He said, the linens are all clean. I'll have food delivered there. And it will, you be by, you just need a good rest. And I said, Sir, I don't need a rest. I need some answers in my life. I, I, I understand I'm looking and I don't know what I'm looking for. I'm searching and I, I don't know what I'm searching for, but I feel like there's something else more than what I have. And he said, Okay, I, I, I'm going to give you a, a, a airline uh, ticket from. Uh, Los Angeles to Montreal return, and I'm going to send David with you. David, uh, is, if he's still living, is a bishop in Anaheim, California. And uh, so when we got up in the air, apparently they had not told him uh, what, uh, why we were going to Montreal. And he asked me, he said, he said, now tell me, why are we going to Montreal? And I said, David... And, and there was a quiet excitement when something happens to you and you know it's divine. There is an excitement in the innermost part of your being. And I said, David, I believe I heard the audible voice of God. And like everyone else, he said, you're just like me. You're tired. We've been studying. And so when we got to Montreal... Uh, we left, uh, we, we uh, got off and, and uh, um, had a modest but tasty, a tasty lunch. But he said, uh, now let's go back home. Let's go back. I was to take my vows with him. And I said, no, I'm going to the Trappist Monastery, northwest of Montreal. I said, I may change my mind, but right now I'm going to the monastery. And when I arrived at Oka... The abbot met me at the door, and I had been there before. He knew me, and I told him, I said, I need a rest. I need, I need some answers. And uh, he said, you're welcome. He said, you become part of us. He said, it may be where God wants you to be a monk and be here with us at Oka. And he said, you just uh, take your liberty. And so I prayed, and, and I was there for quite some time, just outside the abbey, there is a graveyard of the deceased monks. Uh, these people start their day about 3 o'clock in the morning. They pray for two solid hours before they eat. They're vegetarians. And, and um, I remember at Our Lady of the Cape, Notre Dame du Cap in Cape de la Madeleine, Quebec, uh, concrete steps. Sister Hanscom has been there. I think there's maybe 19 or 20 concrete steps uh, that leads up to this massive basilica uh, that was built in honor of Our Lady of the Cape, the Mother of Jesus. And the doors are about, I guess, 15 foot high. And above the doors, there is a statue of the Virgin Mary. And I have, along with others, walked up those concrete steps on my knees, uh, uh, praying my rosary. And, 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 and let me say this in passing, church. You apostolic people, you have the truth. And when your pastor asks you to pray, you don't need to take it lightly. As a matter of fact, we need to understand we're going to stand in judgment uh, with those priests and those nuns uh, that pray for hours uh, to gods that can neither hear nor answer prayer. I want to tell you something about the God we serve. He hears uh, and He answers our prayers. Uh, he's never asleep. Uh, he's never on a journey. But He is as close uh, as the mention of his name and so I was outside praying in the graveyard it was a it was a favorite place for the monks to pray and I was walking among the dead I was literally walking among the dead I am so glad this morning 
that I have the Holy Ghost and I'm walking among the living. I say I'm walking among the living. There's nothing dead about this. Amen. If you've got the Holy Ghost, there's nothing dead about you. But this Christ that lives inside of you is life. Can we clap our hands unto the Lord? Amen. Can Oh, come on, somebody. Amen. Come on, somebody. He is the King of Kings. He is the only potentate. He is Jehovah. And as I was praying in that graveyard, I remember stopping, tears in my eyes, and I said, God, makes a difference when you pray to God because God answers prayer. I've had people tell me that God does not answer the prayers of the sinner. I challenge that. I challenge that. But I said, God, I'm so tired of ritualism. I'm so tired of formality. I'm so tired of going in a confessional box, confessing my sins, receiving a penance, and going out and doing the same things all over again. How many believe that God answers the prayer of a hungry heart, a sinner's heart? Yes, thank you. I'll tell you of an incident that happened. I was sharing it with Pastor. One day, Bishop Gagnon was going to be there. He's the prince of the church. He wears a ruby ring on his right hand. And when you greet the bishop, you kneel down and you kiss his ring as a sign of uh, your respect and submission to his authority. And so we were in the library. Bishop Gagnon was going to be there. Yvonne Carponce told us you don't have to greet the bishop if you don't want to because you're studying. And we were in the library, my good friend, uh, Gaston Pierre-Louis d'Aetzi in the West India Islands. And he said, are you going to greet the bishop? And I said, no, I'm not going to greet the bishop. He said, I am. He said, why aren't you? And I said, could I tell you the truth of what I'm thinking? And he said, yes. I said, you're not going to like this. I said, Gaston, you're not going to like what I'm about to say. He said, well, say it anyway. I said, I just don't feel like it's right for one man to kneel down and kiss the ring of another man. Right. Yeah. Pastor, it was not until God filled me with the Holy Ghost that, that I read in the good word of God where Peter went down to Cornelius' house and Cornelius came down and fell down before him and began to worship him and Peter took him by the hand and he said, stand up. My... I myself also am a man. If you're going to give praise, give it to God. If you're going to give honor, give it to God. Don't give it to a man. Give it to God. And my thinking was, could that have been the Holy Ghost talking to me in the seminary? Absolutely. After I left Our Lady of the Cape, I went back to New Brunswick. It's north of the state of Maine where I was raised, met my family, and then went to the Seminary of Theology there. And I met my good friend. He's a, he's a priest, uh, Father Leo Gregoire. And uh, he said, what are you doing here? He was actually going to go to California for my ordination. And... I said, and, 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 and we, we had been friends a long time. We studied theology together. And, and I said, Leo, I believe I've heard the audible voice of God. I believe God has spoken to me. And he said, it was probably the intercessory prayers from the saints of God. It was probably the mother of Jesus intervening on your behalf. I said, I don't know what it was, but it was real. And I said, Leo, I believe there's something else somewhere. And he said, there is nothing else. 
as he smoked his export A cigarettes one after another, he said, you are in the will of God. You are in the will of God. And so we talked until the wee hours of the morning and he convinced me the next day I needed to go back to California. I did not know any apostolic. I had no one to show me the way at that time. No one to tell me the truth. And so the next evening, he, he had convinced me to go back and I had my return ticket uh, from Montreal to Los Angeles. Well, he was alone at the seminary. The theologians had not arrived. The, the seminarians were not there. And he was taking care of some juvenile delinquents. So he couldn't leave. Well, that was in the fall of 1972. Uh, this year marks 44 years in the apostolic faith. Uh, and so hitchhiking was popular at that time. Now... It scared me to death to see my children and my grandchildren on the side of the road the way our country is today. But it seemed like everybody was friendly back then. They, so many people knew people and, and was always anxious to help somebody. And so I told him, I'm just going to go down to the road. I had two little bags and uh, I will hitchhike to Perth, which is like 20 miles away, and get a bus from Perth to Montreal and then I had my return ticket from Montreal to Los Angeles. And so I got down to the road. It was very country. I mean, I mean, very country. Um, there were no cars. Night had already claimed the day. There were no cars coming. So I remembered someone telling me about a town called Plaster Rock. I had never been there before. But it was a pulp town. They had a mill there. And I thought, well, I'll just go there and see if I can get a job. And then what I'll do is I will go to Presque Isle, Maine, and then fly from Presque Isle to Montreal, and then from Montreal to Los Angeles, which would save me that 400-mile trip on a bus or whatever it was. I crossed the road, going in the opposite direction, and immediately the lights of a car penetrated the darkness. I don't know how this church here in Georgia believes it, but I believe God dispatched an angel from the throne and driving that car. Amen. I did not know it, but that next day, I would meet the lily of the valley. I would meet the Rose of Sharon. God had prepared for me in that town a lighthouse, a soul-saving station. And so he stopped, and I opened the door, and he said, where are you going? And I said, Plaster Rock. And he said, get in. I put my two little bags in the back, and I got in the front seat with him. I guess it was uh, maybe, Sister Hanscom, 15, 20 miles to Plaster Rock from there, and, and, but he never spoke another word the whole time. But every once in a while, he would look over at me and smile as if to say, I know who you are. I know where you're going. And the reassurance on his face was telling me everything is going to be all right. <laughs> Can we lift our hands and praise him? And I just feel this morning, everything is going to be all right. Whatever your situation is, if you put your hands in that nail-scarred hand, everything is going to be all right. He let me out. It was a little small town. He let me out. It, was maybe a little, it wasn't even a square. There was a, a hotel there and a, a post office. It was, but there were some young people there and I asked them, I said, I'm here to get a job. I have a little money, I don't want to spend it, but I'm looking for an inexpensive hotel or motel. And one boy spoke up and said that there is a pulp convention in town. Both hotels are full. Uh, there'll be no room. He said, but my dad has got an old log cabin out in the woods about a quarter of a mile from here. He said, you're welcome to go there. Well, this was 
in the fall of the year. This was in September, and there was already some snow on the ground. And he said, you can spend the whole winter there if you want to. Well, I didn't want to do that, but I needed some quiet. Have you ever felt, I need some me time? Just, not that I... I love my wife, I love my children, I love my grandchildren. You can say I love my husband, I love, but I just need a little me time. And so I was feeling that need and I said, okay. And he led me through the woods. I guess he was probably 17, 18 years old. And we got to this dilapidated log cabin. The roof had not caved in, but it was in very bad shape. And uh, he said, here it is. And he walked nonchalantly in the other direction. I went inside and I lit a candle. The, 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 the stuffing had come out from between the logs. Uh, wind was blowing through the, the logs. Um, there were empty beer cans around the rafters. Uh, the skeletal remains of days gone by, snowmobile parties. Uh, there, was a there was a stove, but there was no pipe. Uh, there was no food to be found. Uh, there was a bed, but there was no mattress. You could see the floor uh, through the springs. But I wasn't hungry. I, I feel like it's raining outside, but it's fixing to rain in here. I, I mean, it's, uh, I feel like the water of the Holy Ghost is... It, 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 it's, it's going to fall in here. I feel like something divine is about to happen in this house. I feel like somebody's going to get a divine healing here this morning. Somebody's going to stretch their hand toward God for the first time. And, and so I, I begin to pray. I prayed to the Virgin Mary. We, we taught, we prayed. I prayed in English. I prayed in French. I prayed in Latin. I prayed to the medieval saints. Uh, uh, I, I wasn't hungry. I needed some answers in my life. I was 23 years old. And so about, I guess it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, I set my rosary down on a little nightstand and, and my bravery, and I got down on my knees before God. And I'm not ashamed to say it this morning, church. I cried like a baby. I was 23 years old, but I said, God... If there's a God in heaven, I need some answers in my life. Uh, I'm looking, but I don't know what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm searching, but, but what am I searching for? Why am I not in California? I need some answers in my life. That night, I fell asleep on those springs, and God gave me a dream. The dream was divine. I was drowning in a lake. And on both sides of the lake were mountains. I had just come from the Oka Monastery. The lake is called Lac Le Du Montagne, or Lake of the Two Mountains. And in that dream, God was showing me that I was literally drowning in man-made religious Christianity. Um, I was going down in that water for the last time. I knew I was so weak that when I went down this time, I wasn't coming back. I couldn't get back. And all of a sudden, I saw this humongous hand in that dream coming over the mountains. It was bigger than the mountains. It dictated to the mountains. There was nothing below that could stand to that hand. And it was coming toward me. And I thought, it's so big. And I'm so small and I'm so weak. It's going to drown me. But when it got to me, it was the size of a normal man's hand. And he plucked me out of the water. And he put my feet on the shore. He was showing me his incarnation. Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost were the hands of God reaching down from the infinite to the finite. If you remember this dream, because in that morning... God was going to give me the, in, in, the interpretation of the dream at the apostolic church. So I put my rosary in my pocket. I walked out of the woods. I was a devout Roman Catholic. I loved my traditions. I loved my history. 
And so I was walking down the road and I got to the driveway that led to St. Thomas Aquinas Roman Catholic Church. Did not know any tongue-talking people. Did not know any... I did not know anything about any of that. But I stood there and I just stopped and tears came to my eyes and I said, God, again, I'm tired. I'm tired of ritualism. I'm tired of going in that confessional box, confessing my sins to a mortal priest. I had no authority, God. I had no power in my life. And then all of a sudden, as a Roman Catholic, I felt myself in another realm. It was strange. And in that realm, I believe I heard the audible voice of God again. And God said, down the road, there's an apostolic church. And I looked at the mother church not wanting to do her a disservice, but I was so hungry to know God. And I started walking down the road. Got to the end of the town, about to go back to Mass, when I looked down in the holler, and I saw a little country church. And I looked at the sign, and the sign said, Holiness Apostolic Church. It was the United Pentecostal Church of Plaster Rock. And I went up to the door. I didn't know if I should go in or if I should go back to Mass. But I went in and I sat down on the back pew. I made myself as small as I could. I didn't want anybody to know I was there. But I was anxious. The first thing I noticed, there was no altar on the platform for this the sacrifice. And there were no statues in the most modern Roman Catholic church is a statue of the Madonna, the mother of Jesus. I learned after God filled me with the Holy Ghost, he doesn't want statues in his house. He wants real people. He wants real men. And he wants real women to worship him in the spirit. That is the Holy Ghost and in the truth. I was waiting. All of a sudden, a man came to the platform. He didn't have on priestly vestments that I was used to. He had on a suit, a business suit. And he came to the pulpit, and I edged up on my seat. I was so anxious to hear what he had to say. But he didn't say anything. He just threw back his head. And he began to sing the songs of Zion. For the first time in my life, brother, with the saints of God, I felt the Shekinah glory of the Lord God Almighty. I watched those people as they worshiped God. And all of a sudden, another man came to the pulpit. And he said, saints... There's a blind man in the house. Not physically blind, but spiritually blind. And God is going to open his eyes this morning. He invited the church to pray. I watched as those saints all turned at their pews on their knees. They lifted their arms with effortless grace uh, between those pews. Uh, I watched as tears began to flow. And I didn't want to lift my hands just because they were lifting their hands. Uh, but I remember praying, God, will you make it uh, in my life uh, where I can lift my hands uh, the way they lift their hands? Uh, amen. And, and, and that man, the second man, came down to where I was standing. I didn't know what to do. He put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Son, do you want to go to the altar? When he put his hand on my shoulder, tears literally gushed out of my eyes. I said, Sir, I don't know where the altar is, but yes, I want to go. And he led me up that long aisle and he said, Kneel here on the floor. And I kneeled on the floor and my familiarity with the priesthood taught me 
announced to me, you are not in a confessional box in front of a mortal priest, but you are in front of the high priest, the King of kings and the Lord of all, all of the... I feel like somebody wants to give him some praise. I feel like there's an apostolic in here. You've got the Holy Ghost. You've been baptized in Jesus' name, and you just feel like giving him a little bit of praise. Well, go ahead. He loves it. The Bible said he inhabits the praises of his people. Clap your hands, all ye people, and shout, shout with the voice of triumph. Before the Lord, I repented of my disobedience toward Him, and I meant it. I said, I meant it. When you repent, you got to mean it. And when I got up from repentance, they said, now... You've got to be baptized in Jesus' name. I said, well, I was baptized. They said, but you've got to be baptized in Jesus' name. And they can't, we're not going to sprinkle you. We're not going to pour water on your head. We're going to put you under the water, your whole body under the water in Jesus' name. I said, why in Jesus' name? You people were so quick to respond. And you said, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby ye must be saved. So my response was, I've come this far. Take me to the water. But don't pour water on my head. Don't sprinkle water on my body. But put me under the body and under the water in Jesus' name for the remission of my disobedience toward God. They baptized me in Jesus' name. We don't need to be quick to get people filled with the Holy Ghost. Because there's a cleansing process before you get there. There's a cleansing place at the altar, and there's a cleansing place in the water. Pharaoh followed Moses to the water. But the water saved Moses and drowned Pharaoh. Satan can drive you all the way to the waters of baptism. But what saves you will destroy him in the end. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap for praise. I say there's a cleansing process before we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And then, if there was a roast in the oven, it got burnt. Because they weren't interested. They said, let's pray. Now you need the Holy Ghost. And if it takes all day, we're going to stay right here with you until you get the Holy Ghost. Uh, sometimes I'm afraid we give up too quick. Uh, amen. And so I, I said, the Holy Ghost. And, and, and they said, and you're going to speak in another tongue. Well, it took me forever to learn the French language. And, and now you're going to say, in a moment's time, I'm going to speak in another language. Uh, and I, it kind of took me back a little bit. And they said, you're going to speak in another tongue when you get the Holy Ghost. And so I said, well, I don't know about it. But I, if it's for me, I want it. You see, church, if it's for you, you want it. Amen. If it's good for you, you want it. Who would reject a good thing like the baptism? of the Holy Ghost. Uh, amen. So I began to pray. I was at the altar and I said, God, they told me that I needed the Holy Ghost. And there was a mother in Zion somewhere beside, beside me praying. And she said, praise Him. And I said, God, I, I can't go to heaven. She said, praise Him. I said, God, I need the... She said, praise Him. 
She kept saying, praise Him. She kept saying, praise Him. Down deep from her soul, you can hear, just praise Him. All of a sudden, I forgot I needed the Holy Ghost. I forgot I wanted the Holy Ghost. And I lifted my hands. And just in a moment's time, God filled me with the Holy Ghost. And I began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. Can we clap our hands unto Him? Do you believe that He's the King of Kings and that He's the Lord of Lords? I want us to stand right now in Jesus' name. You remember when God touched you for the first time. You remember when you went in the water in Jesus' name. You remember when God filled you with the Holy Ghost. This altar is open right now. I'd like for us to come. Get as close to the altar as we can. And just lift our hands. You praise Him differently than somebody else. But you praise Him the way you want to praise Him. Amen. Some dance. Some shout. Some weep. Some lift their hands, but you praise Him the way God wants you to praise Him. Hallelujah. <laughs> Ikatoria Bahashanda Yatolo Huria Hashanda Yandara Mahaya. Ikotoria Mahashakataya. That's all right, folks. We're just going to praise Him. We're going to praise the one true and the living God, the God that hears and the God that answers prayer. Ikotoriam Dada Maria Shototorian Dada Mahaya. Ikataya Sotokoti and Dada Mahaki and Dada Mahaya. Ikoria Hasaya Dada Maria Tikiya. That's right, brother. Just go ahead. You are a servant of the Most High. If there's anybody that's got a right to praise Him, you've got a right to praise Him. Anoint the man of God, Lord, I pray. Ikashataya, use it for the furthering of your kingdom, Lord. I pray for you in Jesus' name. Dear Lord, I come to you right now, God. God, so thankful that I know you in the power of your resurrection. God, I'm asking you to touch this precious lady, Lord. Anoint her, dear God. Reach out to her family, dear God. You can do anything. Woo! <laughs> May I pray for you, man. In Jesus' name, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Mikaya, yeah. For your glory, Lord. For your glory, Lord. Children. 
somebody's to see them come where they need to be. Also, I did want to say, now, brother and sister Hanscom, this is what they do for a living. They drove almost seven hours down from just south of Nashville down here to do this. She's just had surgery. Her shoulder, she can't even shake your hand. And uh, she has to shake with the other hand. Takes gas to do that. They have bills to pay. 
So we're going to pray and just God moves on your heart. Just give them a love offering to help them on their way. Also, they sell the books, Sons of God, another great book about church history and uh, about how all of history is about the sons of men building Babylon and the sons of God trying to get everybody to the new Jerusalem. So it's just wonderful, wonderful. So let's just pray. God, I glorify you. I thank you, Lord, for what you've done in all of our lives, Jesus. And I thank you for what you've done in Brother and Sister Hanson's life, God. Truly, truly, you led them. You saw the sincerity and the hunger, and you filled them. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I glorify you. I love you. And God bless all your people. God, if you've touched us to give financially, let us give financially. God, prayerfully, let us give prayerfully, God, with our prayers. God, with both prayers and financially, let us do that. And God will give you the glory and the honor and the adoration and the thanksgiving. God, it all belongs to you, God. In Jesus' magnificent, magnificent, holy name. And why don't we all